everyone. Uh, my name is Weiyuan, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, how to make development stubbing, or how I tried to make development stubbing easy for my teammates as well as for myself. Okay. Okay. So first, let me go to the motivation. Uh, why is there a need to do this? So let's say we have this production code over here. So you have some controller that requires some weather gem that takes uh, this weather data and render it on some view. Okay, and in production, sometimes bad things happen. Uh, for example, this gem uses uh, it uses some API endpoints to some server, and let's say the server goes down. So this data is not available. Uh, what you can do in production is you check if the data is there. If it's not there, you render an error. But what about development? Uh, if you're a de developer and you're writing this view over here, you want to see the results render on this view. You want to see what you are doing if it's rendering correctly. Or if you are writing some algorithm, you want to see the results appear. And it, it, it's not going to be helpful to you if this data is not available at this time. Okay. And another problem is that what if this uh, data that, or this variable that you're interested in is gated behind some complicated layer of logic. For example, you have all these methods calling each other, and then the final value goes to this variable. Okay. So this is the context of the issues that I faced in my work at Viki. Uh, because as the, as the developer in the development environment, I'm also the tester as well as the user. So I want to see these results appear. And by solving these problems, I should be able to develop more smoothly. Okay, so I decided to look into stubbing. And the first solution that I looked at for stubbing is stubbing via assignment. Okay, so this is the code we had just now. And so I'm sure most of us will have done this before. You just comment out some code and then you just uh, assign some data to some variable. Okay. And this works if the data that you are stubbing is very simple. But what if the data that you're trying to stub is, let's say, some nested hash or some array of uh, hashes in this hash again? Okay. So uh, you end up writing a lot of code just to stub code. Okay. So and another, thing, uh, another problem that comes from this solution is, uh, as the person that writes this stub, you are the only person that knows what it does. I mean, you could reuse it by copying it and pasting in other actions but none of your teammates know about what you are doing. Okay? So uh, it's not at all a scalable practice. So let's try to improve that. So what if I were to put the data in a JSON file and read it uh, before I do the stuff? Okay? So it should go something like this. Okay? But there's still, some, there's still a key problem with this solution. You are still writing code uh, in order to perform this stuff. And one problem is what if this code accidentally passed some code review and it ends up in a production environment? So you're like showing all your users you know, some stuck uh, results, and this is not what you want. Okay. So uh, since we've identified you know, some problems with this first solution, I was uh, thinking about uh, how about we stop the entire environment instead. Uh, in my context, I'm using a gem that points to some, uh, that has some uh, endpoints that point to some server. So what if I were to stop this endpoint? Okay, so Let's say if you have a gem or module that you're using that could be configured, you could just change those domains very easily. Uh, but let's say you are using some gem that has hard-coded domains and all that. Uh, so this is one way I found out how to do it. So let me just show you. It's okay. Yes. Okay. So this is my local host environment for Viki. And let's say I have this website Neopets that uh, I want to redirect to my local host. Yes, it still exists. Uh, okay, so first thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to access this uh, host file within uh, my uh, machine. So this, is, this file is available for Unix uh, environment. Uh, for Windows, I believe there's an equivalent as well. Okay, so I'm going to uncomment this line. Okay, so now what should happen is that neopets.com should redirect to my local host at port 80. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, ngix. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to. Okay, so the block that I'm interested in is over here, as you can see. All I'm going to do is just uh, check for the domain that I'm trying to stop. And what I'll do is I'll just proxy this uh, traffic to port 3022. Okay, so let's start that and refresh. Come on. <gasps> So now, yep, it's pointing to localhost. 
What? What? Okay, so just to recap what I just did, so I've used the host file to redirect uh, the traffic from a certain domain to localhost. Okay, and then I use ngix as a reverse proxy to proxy it to some uh, local server that I've set up. Okay, and then following this, all you need to do is just set up a local uh, server in your development machine. Okay, and you will be done with this stubbing of the environment. So we see that there are some benefits to be had with this solution. What happens is that uh, if you have uh, observed, I have not talked about my main application at all. So this helps us to mitigate the risk of actually writing code into our main application and ship it into production. Okay, but you know, as you saw me just now, I'm like fiddling through a lot of things. It's like there's a lot of steps to actually set up this stubbing environment. Uh, and yes, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort to actually do this and you have to maintain two repositories from now on. You know, your main project as well as the project that you are uh, using for the stub. Okay, and high, there are high barriers to usage. Uh, what do I mean by that? If let's say I'm one of the colleagues that I'm recommending to use this system, I'll probably look at him and say, you know, this is going to take like maybe three minutes, four minutes to set up or even longer period. Uh, I would rather go for my first solution, which is to command code and just put the data in right away. I mean, because I'm just testing code, I want to see the information render right away. Okay, so since there are problems that were identified with this other solution, you know, I was now thinking again, is there any other way that I can do this? So how about stubbing the gem and service directly? Uh, meaning, how about stubbing those uh, methods? You know, if you have used something like the RSpec gem before, you could uh, write unit tests and uh, start those methods. Okay, so firstly, we have uh, this uh, one stop that I wrote was something like this. Uh, you put, you redeclare a uh, method within some uh, development block, uh, development if conditional block. Okay, so this way you would mitigate the issue of, uh, sorry, you would mitigate the issue of having this code actually end up in production. Okay, but there's still another problem with this solution. What happens is that uh, I'm now writing code to start code again. And let's say this gem or service I'm trying to start has uh, n classes and m methods. You know, I'm ending up going to rewrite n times m methods. You know, in fact, you're just rewriting the entire gem in the application. And there's nothing easy sounding about that at all. Okay. So I was researching into this and I was thinking, is there a way to move the class names as well as the method names into you know, a JSON file that we can be using over here. And then we'll just read this JSON file and just stop everything. You, know, you have some magical wrapper class that do all of this. Okay, so I was uh, researching to it and I found this uh, few methods that could be used to do that. Uh, firstly, let me go into, so the first one is constatize, which is a Rails method. Uh, what you do with that is you transform a string into a class reference. And uh, for Ruby, if you're using vanilla Ruby, you could use constant get to uh, mock that behavior. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate that, and just to show you, okay, I'm going to be including this file. Let me make it bigger. So what I'm going to do doing here is I'm going to include this. I'm going to uh, define a class for demo class with a static method that returns a value of five, and the second class is basically just me uh, defining the constantized method because I'm not using a Rails console. Am I speaking too fast? Just to check. Okay. <laughs> Speed it up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, okay, so. Let's the R B. Okay, so let's say I want to have a reference to a class. So, you know, I write some code for demo class, you know, I'll, I should get a, uh, that class back. Okay, and then let's say if I'm uh, writing some string here. Okay, again, string, right? So let's say I call constant ties. Okay, now you see you get back a class reference, uh, not the string itself. Okay. okay, let me go back here. Okay, so the second method I'm going to be talking about is called method. So this method you could call on a class. Uh, what happens is that you will be able to get the method object from the class itself. Uh, think of it as like, uh, you know, in JavaScript, you're able to assign functions to variables. Okay, so this is, I would say, similar behavior to that. Okay, so let's, so let me just show you how it works.
okay? And just to prove to you that I'm not lying to you, you know, I will just do this dot call, okay? And I'll get the value of five. Okay, so this is how it works. Okay, and the last one we're gonna be talking about is define singleton method. So this one is, uh, again, a class method for defining static methods. Uh, this is where the magic occurs, where you'll be using this to do the actual overwriting of these methods. Okay, so, uh, so one thing to say is that the, for this uh, define singleton method, it will be able to take in three types of parameters, procs, uh, unbound method, or method. Okay, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll just be using a proc. Okay, and let's say I'll do something like this, and I'll, so now I'm writing a proc in, and I'm gonna return a value of 10, okay? And again, just to prove to you I'm not cheating you, I will call the method, okay? So now you will return the value of 10, okay? And uh, if you're curious, if we go back to our original method that we had a reference, or we get an object reference to just now, uh, do call on it, you still get a value of five. Okay, so essentially you have stuck the entire function entirely from there. Okay, so let's get back to this. Okay, so how I visualize this entire stuff, uh, that how I want to build it is that, okay, let's say we have some Rails uh, application. Okay, so the current situation is that the controller has some actions that's calling some gem. And I'm going to be building this magical wrapper around this uh, gem as well as, well as uh, reading from this JSON file. And what I'll do is I will uh, read these results, uh, the classes as well as the methods that I want to start from this JSON file. And I will stop uh, if the results are found. If not, I'll direct the traffic back to the gem and uh, let them call the original method. Okay, so uh, again, this is just uh, the JSON file of how it would look like. And okay, so just to show how this stubbing code would uh, appear in uh, Rails. Okay, so firstly, I'm going to read the file and for, I'll iterate through each class, use constatize to get the class reference, and then I'll iterate again for each method. Okay, and then I'll use the method method to, uh, to get the, uh, the original method itself, uh, as well as use define singleton method to do the stub. Okay, and what I'll be doing in the stub is very simple. I'll just be checking if the data is there. If it's there, I'll return the data. If it's not there, I'll call the original method. Okay, and once we reach that stage, we decide to augment it even further. Is there a way to actually stub parameters? So within the JSON file, uh, we allow our developers to add in parameters and uh, we'll check to see if the input parameters meet a certain combination or return a certain stub result. Another thing we uh, improved uh, to this entire format was to allow for namespaces. Uh, for example, let's say I'm stubbing the user privileges of an admin, and these user privileges could come from many different classes and many different methods. So I'll package them all together within this JSON file and put them under this namespace. Okay, so the final solution, uh, I've dumped it down, it looks something like this. So you have some method from the stubber class uh, called stub classes. And over here in the main code, all you need to do is just invoke a before filter and uh, provide the file name as well as the, the namespace, which is the uh, whatever conditions that you are trying to invoke in your stub. Okay, and uh, by doing this, you are actually able to start for every single action, not just one single line over here. In fact, if you have 10 lines over here that's using some uh, method from this uh, gem and you have other actions, in fact, one single before filter is able to stop every single thing uh, in this code. Okay, so the benefits to be had from this solution is that the JSON file format, as long as the, this format is very well defined, you can share it between teammates. Uh, and it's still possible to ship this as production. I mean, but the thing is because it's in a development, uh, sorry, it's in a if conditional block, checking if it's a development environment, we, uh, the stubbing code will never run. Okay, this is especially important for us. And not a lot of effort is required, as you saw. Uh, only one before filter required now. Okay, yep, that's the end. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna demonstrate briefly how that works. Okay. So let's say I have uh, my account over here uh, for wiki.com. So this is uh, my actual details for my wiki pass. 
and let's say if I want to just uh, mock up something very quickly. So as a developer, uh, I want to you know start this entire all these contents uh, immediately. You know, what I need to do is just pass in some parameters over here. Okay, so this will invoke the uh, the namespace for none inside some uh, this uh, pass this pass ex uh, stuff that I have. Okay, so as you see, it will immediately change. Okay, yep. So that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. Do I send some burning questions? No questions, anyone? Well, well I, I see that you, uh, you did was you did a before filter, right? Yep. So basically, actually, if you want to simplify that even further, yep. you can actually have your 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 environment code can be hit using initializer, right? Yes, yeah. it's in the and, and then what you can do is um, you have a folder with all the JSONs, so you have a proper uh, uh, controller naming convention, Correct. and then you have a new app controller, right, inherited from app controller called advanced controller, which automatically hits the before filter and checks if the JSON is available. If it's available, you stop it. Mm. If it's not available, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. So you know that kind of controller. So you don't have to keep adding this before filter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the before filter was more of to allow the developers to choose when they want to start. Ah, see, so see. they can choose the conditions very quickly. I see. Cool. Any more questions? What's the app icon next to source tree? Sorry? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this? Wireshark? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Thank you so much. <laughs>